Welcome back, everyone. First off, some news updates. A flurry of natural disasters is continuing across China. In Hubei province of China, close to 29,000 citizens were evacuated as a nearby reservoir dam is showing signs of deformation and also is beginning to slide. The incident is taking place amid continuing heavy rains in China, going over 30 days so far. Near the middle reaches of the Yangtze River, which has been overflowing as well, the water level at the Baiyang Reservoir in Huanggong City of Hubei rose to dangerous levels, and the dam began to slide and to show signs of deformation, again, putting an area of over 620 square miles at risk. The reservoir was built back in 1958, spans several villages, and can hold around 78 million cubic feet of water. And other reservoirs may also be at risk in China. By July 5th, around 1,094 reservoirs just in Hubei had exceeded their limits. And more than 11 counties and cities, including Wuhan, the epicenter of the CCP virus, the new coronavirus, issued a red code flood warning. Meanwhile, in Yeyong City of Hunan Province, rainfall has reached its highest on record since 1952, and the city issued its highest level flood warning. And in East China, the largest reservoir in the region, the Xinanjiang Reservoir of Qindao Lake in Hangzhou City, opened all nine of its floodgates to discharge water. And the water discharge reached over 14.7 thousand square feet per second. The waters from that discharge will go to the middle and lower parts of the Qingtang River, increasing the severity of existing floods in that region. And in response to this, the highest level emergency warning was issued in Zhejiang province. In Jiangxi province, an estimated 400,000 people are being affected by floods in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River. And also their water levels of lakes is also surging. An estimated 25.9 thousand hectares of crops have also been destroyed in that region, with an estimated cost in damages exceeded 260 million yuan, or about 37 million dollars. And meanwhile, in Yunnan province, a 4.2 magnitude earthquake struck Dongchuan district of Kunming. Now taken together, what are we seeing here? We're seeing natural disasters taking place pretty much all around China right now. 26 different provinces and cities facing floods. And in addition to this, we have earthquakes, we have hailstorms, we have tornadoes. Uh, and in addition to this too, in Inner Mongolia, the Chinese Communist Party has now closed tourist locations after cases were found of the bubonic plague, the Black Death. And meanwhile, in Hong Kong, the authorities there have banned a popular protest song from being sung in schools. And this is again as the Chinese Communist Party has passed these national security laws effectively ending Hong Kong's autonomy. We see free speech ending. We see popular protest ending. We see calls for democracy ending. And now children in schools are beginning to face different forms of pressure from this as well. And meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party has also converted a Hong Kong hotel into the new National Security Office. And so now the CCP agents who will be enforcing these new national security laws have their own office in Hong Kong where they can begin carrying out the different forms of prosecutions under these new laws. And as we mentioned on an earlier announcement, the WHO has now confirmed that its experts will begin traveling to China to try to confirm the origins of the CCP virus, this new coronavirus. And also in context of this, the United States just pulled out of the WHO altogether. And this was in context of the United States determining through a study that the WHO is not able to demonstrate proper separation from the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese Communist Party, meanwhile, was facing pressure from all these different countries, Australia, the United States, even the European Union, calls for investigations into the origin of the virus. They said they would not allow any foreign experts into China to investigate, but they said they would allow the WHO. Now, given the WHO having covered for the Chinese Communist Party during the whole extent of this virus outbreak, and given the U.S. assessment that the WHO has not demonstrated independence from the Chinese Communist Party, why would the Chinese Communist Party select the WHO as being the only external group allowed to go in China to investigate the origins of the virus? And why is the WHO the one now chosen to do this?
And also in a bit of U.S. news, Kanye West has confirmed that he will run for president, and he's asking Biden and Trump to drop out of the race. Now, Democrats have particularly been unhappy with Kanye joining the race because they believe that he's also a Trump fan, and they believe that he will split the black vote. And so there are concerns about that among Democrats who've been criticizing Kanye based on that. And also, given that Kanye has come out supporting Trump in the past, there are also some conservatives who are worried that he will break the Trump voting base. Now, whether any of these are true, we'll have to see. But regardless of this, Kanye has confirmed that he'll be running for president of the United States. Now, for the first story for today, the Chinese Communist Party is expanding its authoritarian reach through Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, the local government is refusing to guarantee press freedom under the new national security laws. Also, the United Kingdom is still considering offering a path to citizenship for some Hong Kongers looking to leave the country. And the Chinese Communist Party is warning them. It is responding by saying that they are interfering in their own affairs. Also, the laws grant Hong Kong police broad powers, including the ability to conduct raids without warrants, to censor even Western companies such as Facebook, which they claim will allow them to force the company to even remove content. And so what are we seeing here? Again, different countries are saying that this new national security law effectively ends Hong Kong's autonomy. And here we see example of this already happening. And again, part of the agreement with the UK handed over Hong Kong to the Chinese Communist Party was that they were supposed to have a one country, two system policy until 2047. This was an agreement that was supposed to last 50 years. And this was under the popular belief at that time among many countries around the world that by allowing the Chinese Communist Party to engage in some of the global free market, that they would become more free, not less free. And what have we seen? We've seen the opposite. The Chinese Communist Party has used its access to different international institutions to implement its own system, to force its own totalitarian nature onto other countries. And now we're seeing it going back on even its agreement with Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, which was really a democratic country in many regards, saw its freedom stripped from it overnight. Imagine being in their shoes, where you're living in a free country, and then one day you wake up and your freedoms have disappeared. For Hong Kongers, this is now the reality. They're being told that police can come and raid their homes without needing warrants. They're being told that even social media platforms like Facebook, foreign companies, can be forced to remove content if they want to continue operating there. They're being told that, say, posting different opinions online could get them thrown in prison, even retroactively. And we look into some other examples of this on the broader picture, for example, of censorship in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong activists, meanwhile, are continuing their protests. They are not giving up and standing up against the CCP. But since pro-democracy slogans can now get them listed as terrorists, many of them are now protesting while holding blank signs. And again, this is another example, this list, this label of terrorism, another example of how the Chinese Communist Party uses slogans as political weapons. The term terrorist, while it has bad connotations in the West, is being used by the Chinese Communist Party, is taking advantage of the emotional attachment to that, length, to that word, and it is using it as a club to persecute its own people. And also reports say that some Hong Kongers have begun removing their internet history. They're trying to scrub their history. Since the new laws in, in Hong Kong allow the CCP to prosecute crimes committed even retroactively. And so, for example, if two years ago they had wrote a post on Facebook, for example, saying they support democracy in Hong Kong, or saying that they support, say, these different protesters out on the street, and there were two million people protesting on the street in Hong Kong, which is a large portion of their population. Now, if they had posted that, they risk being labeled as terrorists. They risk life in prison. And this raises the question as well for many in Hong Kong on how much data the Chinese Communist Party has already collected on them. Going back to 2014, for example, there were reports that the Chinese Communist Party had military spies operating monitoring facilities from a mountain base overlooking Hong Kong. There were photographs of it, there were reports on it. It was not technically a secret, but one of the big questions that was said, asked then and still should be asked now was how much data did the Chinese Communist Party collect on Hong Kongers? And what does it mean for the many people in Hong Kong who have retroactively violated these national security laws? To what extent 
will the Chinese Communist Party carry out its abuses on the Hong Kong people? And also the Epoch Times has been targeted as well to an extent by these new laws. Four distribution staff of the Epoch Times were arrested. They were later freed under threats of ongoing prosecution. One of them recently said that the police had threatened to send them to mainland China to face trial. And the United States, meanwhile, is calling out the Chinese Communist Party for engaging in, quote, Orwellian censorship in Hong Kong. The Chinese Communist Party's forms of censorship outdo anything Orwell could have imagined. When it comes to, say, the different social credit system monitoring practices, where everything you buy online, every person you're friends with, even, for example, facial recognition technology they have in schools, where your facial expression can determine whether you agree with something or disagree with something. The Chinese Communist Party monitors all of these things. And under systems such as the social credit system, these are used to give you a citizen score. And your citizen score is used to determine your freedom or oppression within that society. The Chinese Communist Party is looking to export this. It's what they call their China model. When the Chinese Communist Party goes to other countries in Latin America, when it goes to countries in Africa, when it goes to even, for example, Australia, where in Darwin they've begun implementing some of these same systems, this is part of the Chinese Communist Party's China model, the export of its system of government. When it uses the One Belt, One Road to go into many of these countries, it builds these technological platforms. It builds this infrastructure. And all the local government needs to do is turn it on. This is what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. And what we see right now in Hong Kong is just another example of this. The United States and many other countries are now, are now starting to call it out. They're starting to point out that what the Chinese Communist Party has is a form of Orwellian censorship. And it goes beyond just the technological platforms. Even when it comes to the use of language, for example. China, they talk about power words, not just China, but even communist systems in general. Or when he talked about the ability to, say, imbue different terms with revolutionary potential, with oppressive potential. We can see the Chinese Communist Party doing this right now as we speak. I mentioned before, they're, they're saying that different Hong Kong protesters can be called terrorists if they support democracy. That is what is called a power word. You're taking an existing phrase and you're imbuing it with political connotations. You're subtly altering its meaning so it can be used as a political weapon to persecute your own people. That is what the Chinese Communist Party is doing in Hong Kong right now. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is facing many different disasters in many parts of the country. And one of the largest ones, as I've mentioned before, is very likely, at least in my analysis, going to be food shortages. And we see now an update on this. In Guilong City of Guanxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, a swarm of locusts has landed. Now, there were reports warning that these locusts could arrive in China this summer. And this is amid heavy flooding and rumors, even amid the virus lockdown, that China could face severe food shortages. You might remember some of the previous reporting we've done on this channel about this. For example, there were different alerts that were allegedly, allegedly leaked in China that caused panic. People started panic buying food because they were allegedly leaks official documents of the Chinese Communist Party telling local officials that they should keep at least a few months of food on hand. They were telling local officials that they should hoard food. Those alleged documents, we can't fully verify whether they were true or not, were leaked publicly and people began panic buying. And internally in China there were mixed reports on this. Individuals did come out, even some very influential ones, came out and warned of potential food shortages, of a looming food crisis. And then we saw examples of the same individuals soon after coming out and walking back on their statements. And for the Chinese people, this is not something uncommon to see. This is what happens, again, if they say something that goes against state policy, the Chinese Communist Party goes to them oftentimes and says, you need to give a public apology. You need to correct your thinking and correct your statements. And they'll come out and give these long-winded, you know, breathless statements praising the Chinese Communist Party and its handling of these situations and walk back their statements. But the Chinese people are not stupid. They know how the Chinese Communist Party operates. And so again, there were panics. There was panic buying of food in China because of this. That was just with the, say, lockdowns. That was just with the food shortages facing the virus. Now they have the swine flu, and they have a new strain of it that can, that can allegedly infect humans. They're warning again that this is a possible new pandemic they could face.
they also had the avian flu. And you might remember previous reporting that China had relinquished its policy for grain self-sufficiency. It does not grow enough grain locally in China for its own needs. It imports that grain. And other countries during this virus lockdown had stopped a lot of those food exports to China because they needed to keep it for their own citizens. And so what does this mean, for example, if there's not enough soy in China? Well, it means very likely that they won't be able to fully feed their livestock, that this is used as feed for their pigs. And again, if that is impacted, if the pigs are impacted, if they catch the virus and they have to dispose of them, if the poultry is impacted, if they're having flooding across 26 provinces and cities, and now they're having locusts in other areas. Now, we'll have to see what happens with this, and again, we'll be covering it as there are developments. And the Chinese Communist Party, meanwhile, is facing international pushback for its human rights abuses, its new policies on Hong Kong, its handling of the virus outbreak, and its increased hostilities towards other countries. India, for example, there is a report saying it won't review its decision to not join the RCEP as members prepare to sign this pact. It is backing off plans to join some of these international agreements. In the United Kingdom, for example, the foreign secretary is warning that the Chinese Communist Party cannot be trusted. China freely assumed international obligations to the United Kingdom through the Joint Declaration, which is a treaty between China and the United Kingdom back in 1984, in relation to the way it would treat Hong Kong and in particular respect the autonomy and the freedoms. And therefore the important thing here, and it's a matter of trust, and lots of countries around the world are asking this question, does China live up to its international obligations? Because if they can't be trusted to keep their word on Hong Kong, uh, why would they be trusted to live up to their wider international responsibilities? And this is taking place as the UK is passing different sanctions against China that are similar to the Magnitsky Act. And even the United States is talking about using that against different Chinese officials. And what does that mean? It means that Chinese officials who have engaged in human rights abuses, for example, in Hong Kong or Xinjiang or other areas, can have their own finances attacked. It means that, say, for example, the Chinese Communist Party engages in human rights abuses, which they do on a large scale. It means that officials themselves who have engaged in that can themselves face repercussions, that they themselves will be held accountable. And it is now not just the United States doing this, it's also the UK pushing for this. Also in the United Kingdom, they are now saying that the Chinese state media, CGTN, is violating their broadcasting rules. And so we're seeing this pushback against Chinese state media not just happening in the US, but also now happening in the UK and happening in India. And in addition to this, there's even pushback happening now in the United States even further against Chinese social media apps. Now, you might remember the story we had just recently saying that TikTok appears to be spying on its users. We had a video of this, for example, showing that every time a person typed something on their phone, there was an alert coming up saying TikTok had, was copying the data, that this data was being sent to TikTok. In other words, it appeared that TikTok was key logging users. If you were typing things on your phone, everything you typed was allegedly being sent to them, according to these videos. Now, India banned TikTok from its country soon after that, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in the United States is now saying the U.S. is considering a similar ban on TikTok and other Chinese social media apps. Shouldn't we be considering right now, tonight, a ban on Chinese social media apps, especially TikTok? Laura, your viewers should know we're taking this very seriously. We're, we're, we're certainly looking at it. We've worked on this very issue for a long time, whether it was the problems of having Huawei technology in your infrastructure. We've gone all over the world, and we're making real progress getting that out. Uh, we uh, declared ZTE a danger to American national security. We've done all of these things. With respect to Chinese apps on people's cell phones, I can assure you the United States will get this one right, too, Laura. I don't want to get out. I don't want to yeah. get out in front of the president, but it's something we're looking at. Would you recommend that people download that app on their phones uh, tonight, tomorrow, anytime uh, currently? Only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And despite all of this, amidst all this pressure, the Chinese Communist Party is not backing down on its hostile actions towards other countries. For example, in Canada, a university is now starting to refer to Taiwan as a province of China after facing diplomatic pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, it's recognizing the Chinese Communist Party's forced narrative on Taiwan, which in every regard, other than the Chinese Communist Party's own policy of, say, the One China policy, in every regard, Taiwan is an independent country. 
There are also reports of China fighting a proxy battle with India using Nepal. And they're doing the same thing in other places. For example, in Myanmar, for example, they're accusing the Chinese Communist Party of arming different insurgent groups against the country. In India, just like they're saying with Nepal, the Chinese Communist Party is using Pakistan to also pressure India. This is happening on many fronts. And in Australia, for example, right now, Australians are being warned that if they travel to China or Hong Kong, they risk facing arbitrary detention. Now, the Chinese Communist Party, again, is saying that its national security laws it has put on Hong Kong can even apply internationally. And so if you're a U.S. citizen and you travel to Hong Kong, or you travel to a country that has an extradition treaty with the Chinese Communist Party, you possibly face extradition to China and you could face charges in whatever they say you violated, which can even be online statements opposing the Chinese Communist Party. And this is not something foreign to the CCP to do. For example, after they arrested this Meng Wanzhou, the CFO of Huawei, the Chinese Communist Party arrested two Canadian nationals and accused them of spying. This is being seen as a politicized, tit-for-tat prosecution and the Chinese Communist Party has been trying to use those Canadian citizens as leverage to make Canada release Meng Wanzhou. So the Chinese Communist Party does this. Those individuals are facing the death penalty in China. And under the new national security law, it's saying that it can do that to any country in the world. On this new, say, wolf warrior diplomacy stance the CCP is taking, where they're going after officials in different countries who say anything bad against the Chinese Communist Party, Angela Merkel in Germany is now being attacked by the CCP. In South Korea now, reports are coming out on how the Chinese Communist Party is using different aggressive methods to try to subvert the country. In Taiwan, meanwhile, we mentioned Taiwan and how it's technically an independent country, but the Chinese Communist Party claims ownership over it. In Taiwan, they are worried that the Chinese Communist Party is going to repeat what it just did in Hong Kong to try to seize control of Taiwan. And the Chinese Communist Party has been openly stating this goal. There have been, for example, satellite images showing that at different Chinese military bases, they have a replica of the Taiwanese presidential palace, that they practice for raids on Taiwan, that this is part of the Chinese Communist Party's policy. They want to retake Taiwan. And of course, this is again, this entire picture. These are examples of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing right now with what they call wolf warrior diplomacy. It's diplomats, even though they're being called out across the globe, even though different countries are seeing the Chinese Communist Party for what it is, even though there's different forms of pushback against the CCP for its different forms of aggression right now. Rather than back down, rather than apologize, rather than try to show some level of, say, friendly diplomacy, the Chinese Communist Party is doubling down. It's becoming more aggressive. And this aggression on one end is pushing a lot of countries away. But at the same time, we see examples of the Chinese Communist Party using every element of power that it can possibly use, every lever of power to push forward with its agendas in every part of the world. Now, with that said, folks, again, we'll be broadcasting Monday through Friday, five days a week, so be sure to tune in. And also, for those of you who missed it, Crossroads is now on cable. Look in the link in the description below, and you can find out when we broadcast. And of course, also, folks, if you want to support us, we do have a Patreon. If you want to join our team on Patreon, you can also find the link in the description below. And for our Patreon supporters, every Sunday, I'll be doing a live Q&A. Of course, folks, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, stay free.